Well, friends, today we are in the last of summer 2024's Banned Book and the Bible series. And some of you who haven't been here for, for some of the others may be wondering, well, why would a church <laughs> put banned books in conversation with Bible stories? And the reason that we do this, this series is because the stories in banned books are very often the stories of marginalized people. The, they're the stories that we as a society often try to hide or brush under the rug or don't think are worth seeing and knowing. And so we pay attention to those stories because we believe God cares about the marginalized. Um, and actually, many of these stories often mirror stories in our own Bible, which is important. It's important for us to know that those stories of the marginalized are there in the pages of our Bible and they're there in the pages of the world today. We're going to start with a scripture today from Genesis 37 and I want to invite uh, Gretchen to come up. Listen now to part of Joseph's story from Genesis 37. When Joseph's brother saw him coming, they recognized him in the distance. As he approached, they made plans to kill him. Here comes the dreamer, they said. Come on, let's kill him and throw him into one of these cisterns. We can tell our father, a wild animal has eaten him. Then we'll see what becomes of his dreams. But when Reuben heard of their scheme, he came to Joseph's rescue. Let's not kill him, he said. Why should we shed any blood? Let's just throw him into this empty cistern here in the wilderness. Then he will die without our laying a hand on him. Reuben was secretly planning to rescue Joseph and return him to his father. So when Joseph arrived, his brothers ripped off the beautiful robe he was wearing. Then they grabbed him and threw him into the cistern. Now the cistern was empty. There was no water in it. Then just as they were sitting down to eat, they looked up and saw a caravan of camels in the distance coming towards them. It was a group of Ishmaelite traders taking a load of gum, balm, and aromatic resin from Gilead down to Egypt. Judah said to his brothers, what will we gain by killing our brother? We have come to cover up the crime. We'd have come to cover up the crime. Instead of hurting him, let's sell him to the Ishmaelite traders. After all, he is our brother, our own flesh and blood. And his brothers agreed. So when the Ishmaelites, who were Midianite traders, came by, Joseph's brothers pulled him out of the cistern and sold, them to, sold him to them for 20 pieces of silver. And the traders took him to Egypt. Sometime later, Reuben returned to get Joseph out of the cistern. When he discovered that Joseph was missing, he tore his clothes in grief. Then he went back to his brothers and lamented, the boy is gone, what will I do now? Then the brothers killed a young goat and dipped, dipped Joseph's robe in its blood. They sent the beautiful robe to their father with this message. Look at what we found. Doesn't this robe belong to your son? Their father recognized it immediately. Yes, he said, it's my son's robe. A wild animal must have eaten him. Joseph has clearly been torn to pieces. Then Jacob tore his clothes and dressed himself in burlap. He mourned deeply for his son for a long time. His family all tried to comfort him, but he refused to be comforted. I will go to my grave mourning for my son, he said, and then he would weep. Meanwhile, the Mennonite, Mennonite traders arrived in Egypt, where they sold Joseph to Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, the king of Egypt. Potiphar was captain of the palace guard. For the word of God in scripture, for the word of God among us, for the word of God within us, thanks be to God. Let us pray. O oh God, we come to you this afternoon and we are longing, yearning for justice, for hope, for peace. And so we pray that you would speak into our lives, that you would speak into this congregation, into this community, a fresh word with your still speaking voice. 
And we ask that if we depart from your spirit, O God, that would quickly fall away. Bless the words of our mouths and the meditations of our hearts. Amen. Well, how many of you in the past week have seen something in the news that made you ask, why do we keep letting this happen? Any of you? How many of you in the past week have seen something in the news or on the sidewalk or maybe even in your own home that made you ask, why do we human beings keep treating each other like this? Any of you? Maybe it was the school shooting at Appalachie High School. Or maybe it was the news out of the court system that transgender health care is going to be paused here in Florida. Or maybe it was something else. There's so much right now, isn't there? Today we're back in the book of Genesis. We're back in that book of archetypal stories that explores the perplexing and intolerable patterns of violence and abuse that we repeat over and over again in our common life as siblings in the human family. Those patterns of behavior that leave us asking, why? Why do we do this to each other? Why don't we value each other's lives more? And where is God? Where is God in the midst of all this harm and exploitation that goes on among us. From the first archetypal human siblings, Cain and Abel, one of whom kills the other out of jealousy, to the story of Joseph that we read today. Joseph, whose brothers sell him into slavery again over some petty jealousy. This book, the book of Genesis, it makes us grapple with our human behavior. How can we human beings kill one another so easily, so carelessly? How can one human being treat another like a commodity, like something to sell, like a product? How do we allow violence to be done for profit to people? And again, where is God in all of this? In preparation for this sermon today, I read the seventh most banned book in America. It's an award-winning book called Sold by Patricia McCormick. You know, I've now preached between last summer and this summer nine of these banned books and the Bible's sermons. And I have to say of all of them, this was by far the hardest story for me to stomach. McCormick tells the story of a young 13-year-old girl from a mountain village in Nepal who gets sold by her stepfather and trafficked across the border where she's forced to work as a sex slave in India's red light district. And as I read this novel, I started to wonder if all of us would react a little more violently with a little more disgust to some of the stories in our book of Genesis if we hadn't been desensitized to them, if they hadn't been told to us like nursery rhymes from the time we were children, if we didn't know that happy ending waiting on the other side. You know, Joseph's story isn't the only story of human trafficking in the book of Genesis. You might recall there was also that time when Abraham pretended his wife Sarah was his sister and allowed her to be taken to Pharaoh's palace. In exchange for her, his life was spared and he was treated well and he was given gifts. Now maybe it's just that the authors of Genesis, they spare us the graphic details that authors like McCormick actually take the time to show us. But it's right there between the lines, isn't it? We all know the hell that Sarah must have stepped into there in, in Pharaoh's palace just as we can all guess the hell that Joseph was sold into, even if it's not perfectly spelled out by the authors of Genesis. Or maybe it's that as we read these biblical stories, 
we all feel some chronological distance from them. We assume that these kind of horrors were the kind of horrors that were only present in ancient times and places, not our own. Which is perhaps why stories like McCormick's are so unbearable, why we end up banning them. Because they remind us that those unthinkable stories of familial violence and abuse and exploitation, that they're still happening today. Did you know there are two million children sold each year through sex trafficking? Did you know that Florida is in the top three states in the country for sex trafficking? Or that Tampa Bay right here is a worldwide hub of human trafficking? Human trafficking isn't just something that happened in the ancient world or the third world. It's happening right now, and it's happening right here on our own doorstep. That's incredibly disturbing, isn't it? And it's probably not something that you see when you just look around at our community, right? It's enough to make any of us want to just bury our head in the sand, isn't it? We don't want to know about that human trafficking. We don't want to see news of another school shooting because it's all just too much. It's too much. It makes no sense. These are evils that we can't wrap our heads or our hearts around. Haven't we progressed past the violence of Cain? Haven't we progressed past the exploitative ways of Joseph's brothers? How can we still be living out those patterns of Genesis here within the human family? On the first page of McCormick's story, Lakshmi, her protagonist, she describes the way her impoverished, addicted to gambling stepfather looks at her. She says, my stepfather looks at me the same way he looks at the cucumbers I'm growing in the front of our hut. He flicks ash from his cigarette and squints. You had better get a good price for them, he says. Reading this novel, it, it made me start to wonder if Joseph ever looked at his brothers and saw the way they looked at him with dollar signs in their eyes. Of course, what they were really craving, right, was the affection and affirmation of their father that they thought belonged to Joseph and that they didn't have access to. But they thought they could kill two birds with one stone, so to speak. That if they took Joseph out, well, that the well of their father's love would open to them and, oh, hey, look, there's some traitors. We can make a buck in the process. What is it, friends? that gets us to look at one another as commodities? What makes us think that we can use one another, exploit one another, even kill one another to get what we need, or sometimes just to get what we want? I don't know a single person assigned female at birth who doesn't know what it feels like to be looked at that way. And in fact, many of you assigned male at birth probably know what it feels like to be looked at that way too. It's an icky feeling, isn't it? But it happens every day. You know, even we ourselves here in this room, we probably have looked at people like that sometimes. How many of you who've been here at Good Sam for a while, who maybe you are feeling a little burnt out because you've been investing so much in our wonderful ministry for so many years. How many of you haven't looked at a visitor walking in through those doors and thought, oh, yay, that looks like someone with energy. Maybe they can take my committee spot. Come on, let's be honest. How many of us have thought that before we've even said hello to the person? Right? We all do it from time to time, don't we? We look at other people and we see them as our ticket to something we need or we want. And whether our motives are good or not, it's still disturbing when we look at each other like that. Gretchen may have noticed as she practiced today, but there's not much good news 
in the scripture we read today, at least the portion of it we read today. But of course, Joseph's story doesn't end when his brothers sell them, just as Lakshmi's story in McCormick's novel doesn't end when her stepfather sells her. For Joseph, God shows up in the form of dreams. He starts having these dreams while he's in prison. And Joseph dares to catch hold of those dreams. You know, I think we forget how hard it is to dream, to do something so basic as dream when you're living in such oppressive, cruel conditions, when you have been sold in one way or another. For Lakshmi in McCormick's novel, God shows up in the form of an aid worker, a customer who comes and remarkably doesn't want to do anything to her body doesn't want to take anything from her. He only wants to talk to her and tell her about this shelter he can take her to, a clean, safe place where she'll have everything she needs, where she'll even be able to continue her education, something she wants desperately. He shows her pictures on his phone. And he promises to return for her. And like Joseph, Lakshmi dares to dream. She dares to trust, she dares to believe this stranger with this promising good news. But then three days go by, and it feels like an eternity, and that dream starts to slip. How stupid I was to believe in him. How stupid I am to keep believing, she thinks. She describes how now that she has dared to believe another reality is possible, a reality of freedom, it's so much harder to emotionally detach from what is happening to her each night as customers come and go. After a whole week of waiting with no sign of the aid worker, she reflects, this ache in my chest is a relentless thing, worse than any fever. A fever is gone with a few white pills, but this illness, it's had me in its grips for a week now. This affliction, hope, is so cruel and stubborn. I believe it will kill me. Friends, in a world of exploitation and oppression and injustice, where so many of us have been sold in one way or another, used or exploited for the profit of another, it takes so much courage to hold on to hope. This week, as I watched, as I'm sure you did too, yet another school shooting unfold, another tragedy we allowed to happen, I found that I could echo Lakshmi's thoughts. Even our politicians have been sold, it feels like, to the likes of groups like the NRA, so that even in our democracy, where the majority of Americans want things like common sense gun controls, it feels like it's just foolish to believe anything's ever going to change. In many ways, it would be easier to just resign ourselves to the present reality, to accept that it's not going to change. It takes so much faith not to believe it's just a pipe dream, doesn't it? It takes so much trust to believe that this is real hope we're clinging to and not false hope. To keep holding on to those dreams that God has given us of freedom and beloved community. I think McCormick is right. Sometimes in the moment, hope feels like a cruel, stubborn affliction. Lakshmi's aid worker did finally show up with the police to take her to safety. But her best friend in the house, she won't go with her, even when Lakshmi pleads with her. She won't dare to believe this hope that's been offered to her. Many of us know how Joseph's story goes, and we heard a little bit of it in the hymn we just sang. Because he dares to dream, because he dares to hold on to and share the dreams God has given him, he eventually becomes governor of Egypt and he's able to rescue his family and all of Egypt from famine. 
But here's the part of the story we don't often tell. Despite all these moments along Joseph's story of good news, despite all these moments where God works the bad, terrible things for good along the way, that terrible decision that his brothers made on that fateful day, that decision is going to lead to generations of oppression for their whole family. It will be many generations before Abraham's descendants are free of their slavery in Egypt. And it will take so, so many people along the way, daring to dream, daring to listen to God, daring to trust, even in the midst of unbearable conditions, before that family is finally able to recover and heal from what those brothers did to their brother. So what can we learn from Joseph's story? Well, I think we learn how important it is to catch ourselves in those moments like when you see a visitor walking in those back doors, those moments when we are tempted to use or exploit our siblings in the human family. Because one moment of exploitation can ruin lives for generations, like ripples going out. And it's not easy to undo the knots of injustice that it causes. We must stop ourselves even from the smallest forms of exploitation and abuse and violence. We must treat each other as beloved reflections of God and not as commodities. But I think we also learn from Joseph's story that those who put themselves to the work of untying those knots of injustice, that they are not foolish, despite how they might appear to the world in the moment. Each of those moments when someone dares to dream, dares to hope, those add up. Each morsel of hope that we offer to each other, each little moment when we liberate each other, those ripple out too. Each dream we catch, each dream we dare to share, those can make a big impact. Now you might think that the hero of Lakshmi's story was that American aid worker who showed up. But the real hero, I would argue, and I think the author of the book would argue, is Lakshmi herself. She was the one who caught onto hope when she found it and would not let go. I want to read to you kind of in conclusion here part of McCormick's author's note at the end of the book. She talks about all these people that she interviewed in Nepal and India in her research for this book. But she says, the most touching and inspiring was interviewing survivors themselves. These young women have experienced what many people would describe as unspeakable horrors. But they are speaking out. They're speaking out with great dignity. Some go door to door in the country's most isolated villages to explain what really happens to girls when they leave home with strangers promising good jobs. Some of them, even women who are ill with HIV, patrol the border between Nepal and India on the lookout for young girls traveling without their parents. And some are facing their tra traffickers in court, where it is often their word against the, the fathers and brothers, husbands and uncles, who sold them for as little as $300. Friends, today I encourage us, <laughs> people of Good Sam, to be brave people of faith, brave people of justice. This month, September, we are beginning another justice season with our justice ministry fast. And just next Sunday after worship, we're going to gather and we're going to do what's called a house meeting, where we share with each other the community issues that are personally affecting us or those we know and love. And over the next several months, as we put our nose to the grindstone of justice, we're going to have to keep reminding each other of God's dream. We're going to have to keep reminding each other that it is not false hope to believe that things can change. But it is real hope. It is something that we can make a reality together with God's help. Now in those house meetings, we may not hear stories of human trafficking, but they are here in our community. 
Like I said, there are those marginalized stories that we don't often see or hear. On your way in this afternoon, you probably received a flyer. Clarence may have handed it to you. It's a flyer that lets you know a little bit about Sela Freedom. Sela Freedom is a local nonprofit, a faith-based nonprofit here in Tampa Bay, and they work with survivors of sex trafficking. They have two recovery houses. They have one in Hillsboro and one in uh, Manatee County. And they came and spoke um, a few years ago at the Presbytery of Tampa Bay um, meeting. I, I remember being quite impressed with their work. Um, as with all of these Justice and Mercy Sundays, if this is an issue, a justice issue that particularly touches your heart, um, you have the information there in front of you for how to get involved in volunteering or where to make donations. May God help us as we hold on to hope. Amen.